Hello, everyone. Today, we'll be talking about Bayesian analysis. And in particular, we'll be giving you a framework for understanding Bayesian analysis and how to construct these tables, particularly for exam purposes. I'll be going through one or two examples from this paper by Ogino and Wilson. Uh, I definitely recommend taking a look at this paper if you have a chance. It has some really good examples of how to do Bayesian calculations. We won't have time today to get into all of these examples, but I hope that by going through this first one or two examples, this will be um, good enough to get you a framework for how to interpret and do these calculations on your own. Okay, so we'll start off with a question. So let's say we have a patient indicated here by the arrow and both of her brothers are affected by X-linked spinal and bul bulbar muscular atrophy or SBMA. The question would be, what are the chances that this individual, this woman is a carrier? So take a second to think about that. Okay, so hopefully you've had a second to think about this. And the answer in this case would be 50%. So we know that her mother is an obligate carrier. Her mother's indicated here. And therefore, because she is a carrier, um, her daughter also has a chance, 50% chance of being a carrier, as well as a 50% chance of being a non-carrier. And because this is an X-linked disorder, we wouldn't expect the uh, individual who's a woman in this case to be affected. Okay. Now I'm going to ask a slightly different question. Same pedigree, but let's say that this woman has three unaffected boys. So we see the same woman here and her three unaffected boys here. Now, what are the chances that she's a carrier? Not quite as straightforward. So take a second for, you know, to think about how you might calculate this probability. Okay, so this is a probability question that requires Bayes' theorem, and we'll walk through this. We'll first start with a framework for how to answer this question. So oftentimes, Bayes' calculations are needed whenever you have an if statement. So if the patient has three unaffected sons in this case, um, that's one clue to where you might want to use or think about using Bayes' theorem. The mnemonic we're using here is called hot pink Jeep. So pink with a C instead of a K. These letters will guide you to forming the table, the probability table that we need to answer the question in this case. Okay, so the H, the first letter is for hypothesis. So there will be two or more hypotheses that we'll be testing. These, hypoth these hypotheses should be both mutually exclusive, so yes or no, in this case, either affected or unaffected, so totally different, and then collectively exhausted, exhaustive. So these are the only two possibilities that there are, being either a carrier or a non-carrier. There's no third state. Um, it's either one of these two. And these hypotheses are going to form the columns of our table. Okay. Then we move into the pink Jeep probabilities. These are four different probabilities that we need for every Bayesian calculation. And these are gonna form the rows of our table. So the P stands for the prior probability. The C stands for conditional probability. The J stands for joint probability. And the P stands for the posterior probability. And so one way I remember to, uh, you know, I remember this is just, you know, thinking about a Jeep, like the vehicle, you can see that it has four wheels. And that reminds me that Bayes' theorem also has four probabilities that we need to determine for each uh, hypothesis that we're testing. Okay, so we're going to answer this question here stepwise. So we'll start with the H. So the hypothesis, in this case, we've already established that this individual is either a carrier 
or she's not a carrier. Those are our two hypotheses. There's no alternative states. Um, there's no third state. So this is relatively straightforward, but important to recognize when we're setting up our table. And as we can see, these are two columns, carrier or not carrier. Next, we're gonna go into the prior probability. So there are, again, two mutually exclusive hypotheses. We've established, this was the first question in this video, that the chances that she's a carrier before any prior knowledge of her having kids is one half, okay? So, and then the chances of her not being a carrier are also one half. And so what we see also is that this row sums to one, okay? So that's very important. The prior probability row has to sum to one. If it does not sum to one, there's gonna be a mistake. This is not necessarily true for the two next probabilities, but for the last probability, this also holds true, the posterior probability, that row has to sum to one. Okay. Next, we're gonna talk about the conditional probability. This is the C in pink. So the conditional probability is really asking, in this case, what is the probability that she would have three unaffected sons if she's a carrier. So in this case, we'll just go column by column. So we'll start with this first column. What if she truly was a carrier, okay? Let's just say in, in, in a world, if we knew for certain that she was a carrier, what are the chances that she's going to have three unaffected sons? And that probability is one half times one half times one half, which equals one eighth, right? So. If she's a carrier, the probability that she has three unaffected sons is one over eight. So we're gonna put one eighth here in this grid. Then we ask the sort of alternative question, which is what's the probability that she has three unaffected sons if she's not a carrier, right? So if she's not a carrier, there is, 100% probability that she's going to have unaffected sons because she's not going to carry this disease. She cannot have an affected son. That means she's going to have all uh, unaffected sons. And so the conditional probability for this condition is essentially one. So a 100% chance that we would see this situation were she not a carrier, the situation of three unaffected sons, were she not a carrier, okay? Note that, as I previously mentioned, this row does not have to sum to one, and in many cases, it does not. So if it does sum to one, I actually want you to go back and take a look, right? Make sure that your calculations are correct, but in general, this row does not sum to one, okay? Next, we have the joint probability. So this is the J in Jeep. The joint probability is calculated by multiplying the prior by the conditional. So in this case, relatively straightforward multiplication. We're gonna do this for each column separately. So in this case, we have one half times one eighth. So we get one sixteenth. And then we have one half times one, which is one half. Relatively straightforward, essentially joint reflecting, this is the um, joining or the product of the prior and conditional probabilities. What I'll also say is that the calculating the conditional probability is probably the hardest part. So now that we've gotten through that, essentially things get easier from there. Last, we have the P in Jeep. So this stands for posterior probability. So essentially these are very similar to joint probabilities, just like a modified version of those, except that they have to sum to one. So the joint probability does not, and in many cases will not sum to one. However, the posterior probability has to sum to one. And we have to essentially make it sum to one. We have to make the joint probabilities sum to one. And when we do that, we get the posterior probabilities. Okay. So how do we, how do we do that? 
essentially, we will sum the joint probabilities together. So we'll do 1 16th plus 1 half. That gives us 9 sixteenths. We'll then divide the joint probability in each column by this sum. Okay, so essentially 1 16th divided by 9 16th for this box here. And then we'll have 1 half divided by 9 16th in this box here. And what we end up getting is in this box, we have one ninth, and then in this box, we have eight ninths. And we can see when we sum this row together, we get one, just as we do for the prior probability. So again, very important. This is a way for you to check yourself as well when you're doing these calculations. The first and the last row must sum to one. The middle two rows do not sum to one. Okay, remember that. So overall, what we see from this table is that there is a one ninth probability that she is a carrier and an eight ninths probability that she's a non-carrier. So this should make sense. The probability that she's a carrier is getting pretty close to zero. And let's say she were to have five unaffected boys, that would even be more evidence that she is not a carrier. And so instead of one ninth, that number would be even closer to zero. And then in contrast, as the probability of being a carrier goes down, the probability of being a non-carrier goes up. So her chances of not being a carrier would be getting closer and closer to one as the number of boys, unaffected boys that she has increases. And so that's just a hypothetical scenario, but good to keep in mind as you're thinking about and answering these questions you know, is the probability moving in the direction that you expect? So in this case, I would say the answer is yes. The chance is because she has three unaffected boys, the chances that she's a carrier now that we now that we know about these boys is much lower than one half, which was the probability that we started with, essentially. So thank you for watching this video please consider subscribing and leaving a comment or a thumbs up. And also feel free to sign up for the SteadyRare Genetics Board Prep newsletter at SteadyRare.com. There's also a series on Bayesian statistics in this newsletter. Thank you.